What's, what's their number one fear? What's the number one fear of day traders? I, I'm asking you. I don't know. Okay, so I'll review it to you now that we're recording. According to the article I read, the one that most fear was that everybody was winning and he's losing. Or everybody's losing, he's winning, or something along the same line. Well, if everybody loses and he wins, that can't be a fear, I don't think. I guess it might be, because then, well, the, if you're the king of the hill, then everybody tries to knock you down. No, well, it's not about that. It's not about that. King of the mountain. It's about it, it's about everybody sees it so clearly that this, this could be a losing battle, and you go in anyway, and of course you lose, or something along that line. Of yeah, course, well, that's you know that's like the famous. Well, I say famous. The the the, the mathematician Evaris Galois was challenged to a duel. He was a young man. He was in his twenties. He was challenged to a duel. And he knew okay. damn well he was going to get killed in this duel because he didn't have any talent at dueling. But he had a lot of mathematics that he had in his head. So he stayed up all night writing up his mathematics. And, of course, he lost the duel and he died. But his what he wrote up was called Galois Theory, and it's a very famous piece of mathematics and group theory. But um, he made a choice that he would rather his his work survive than he. <laughs> and so rather than, uh, and, and for whatever reason, he couldn't get out of this duel. I don't know, it's a matter of honor, however it works in, right. in those days. But he, he chose to do something that he wanted to leave a legacy, even though it meant that he was going to die the next morning. <laughs> Of course. Again, like I say, you know, everybody have their own way of defining failures, yeah. success. Everybody have their own way of prioritizing what's more important than survival or not. You know, so but, but I'll certainly t occasionally take a pragmatic solution, even if it's suboptimal, uh, because it. I just don't want to waste my time on a long shot that even if if it wins, it'd be fabulous, but the chances are so low that it's not worth the risk. And other people um, are risk takers. Right. Entrepreneurs tend to be risk takers, and they're they're not they're not afraid to fail a bunch of times before they finally succeed. And if you if you look at the history of entrepreneurs, they'll tell you that they tried and tried and tried, and finally, after you know so many years, they succeeded. But they had years of failure uh, under their belt before they succeeded. And the other person will say. I just want to have a dull middle class existence. It's not, I'm not going to be a hero, but I'm also not going to have to expend a lot of energy not succeeding for many years. I agree with everything you say, except the word that you use for risk. To the, to us, it's a risk. For them, it's the right thing to do. That's well, the most... even, even if they calculate the risk, they say, well, there's only a 2% chance of winning. But you, if you're wow. using calculation, you're, again, if you're using calculation, you think scientific method and all that stuff, that's, as, from the statistical perspective, is a risk. Yeah. The, the point is, is that you can, you can assess the risk accurately and say, I'm willing to take the risk. People, right. people will go out and they'll buy lottery tickets right. where if they win, they're going to win a billion dollars. But right. the problem with winning, winning is so infinitesimally small, but still people will spend the, whatever the two bucks or 10 bucks, whatever it is to buy the lottery ticket, even knowing that the probability winning is infinitesimally small. See, that's, that's, that's your definition of risk. You know why my risk is? I include another parameter, which is not included in your risk assessment, which is if I win lottery ticket, I'll be bombarded with my relatives and my friends looking for money. That's a risk that's going to kill me. So again, the that's what I'm saying to you is that risk is so complicated that whether you have meta perspective or you have side perspective or you know they have include other you know sort of like this the I was talking about the day traders race is about he lose face because everybody was saw that as a it's it's, it's gonna be a, a, a loser and he's losing he's using he he didn't see that or he missed that so that's 
again, according to the article, that's yeah. it's like Lucy. it was a wake up call for me because it's like, There's oh, a... I didn't have no idea that losing face part of the risk. <laughs> There's another one called Pascal's Wager. I bet Eric knows this one. Pascal's Wager. Pascal's Wager was whether or not, um, from a pragmatic point of view, should you express belief in God? And Pascal's wager was the consequences of, of making the wrong choice. And he says that um, you're better off believing in God uh, because if you're wrong, it's not a big deal. Well, I, I don't know. I think I said it wrong. If you're right, I'm not sure if I'm arguing, the, explaining the, the, the cost of failure is high one direction the cost of failure is high, the other direction the cost of failure is a big deal, right? So he, he chooses the one where even if he's wrong, it's no big deal. So he says it's better to believe in God, um, even if you don't really think there is a God, um, because if you're wrong, then it's, you're going to go to hell or some, you know, some. Yeah. So I, or, so, so, so that, so Pascal's wager is one argument for why you should believe in god even if you think it's unlikely that there is a god yeah and and the people the philosophers who try to argue this stuff they they always come back to pascal's wager as one of the interesting ways to reason about it but yeah, that's, that's and for elon musk the way he explained it was the risk of the risk of failure is 90 percent of building the company tesla car company automobile company but it's because the risk is worth taking even if it doesn't succeed. I mean, he had that, that big deal about buying Twitter for what was it, 40 billion or whatever it yeah. was, and, and arguing whether or not it was a risky uh, venture. And he he waffled on it. He basically withdrew it and then he went back in again. Right. Um, and so you can see that people will, will hesitate or oscillate or waffle on where they can't really decide you know, can they stand to lose or, you know, was willing to take a risk for a big win? And what's the cost if you lose? Well, in this case, it was going to be, I don't know, $40 billion or what. Right. Maybe, right. He, didn't, maybe he didn't know how to calculate it. But the way that he think about it is that, again, it's about, it's a worthwhile cost, even if the risk is so high. That's the thing that kept him going. You can yeah. Google for that. And that's, he, he mentioned that multiple interviews that I watched him. That's what he go for. I mean, for a lot of people, if the risk of of failing is extinction, then people will do the heroic thing because if you don't, you're going to die anyway. Right. So, so it's like on, like on those airplanes with the hijackers. You know, they figure they're going to die anyway, so they might as well take the risk and try to take down the hijacker, and right. you either die right now, or you take down the hijacker and you don't die. And, so the, right. the thing is that if the cost if the cost of failing or the cost of not taking the risk is high, you'll right. take the risk. And it's a calculation. And of course, people don't know how to do the calculations. They haven't got time. Yeah. Um, they, they, they can't make a reliable prediction. There's another perspective also, but if I may introduce it, it's called double buying. Oh yeah, I, I know about double bind. <laughs> Can't get out of the bloody double bind. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. You know, every, every decision you make is gonna uh, gonna be costly. <laughs> Great Green Basin reminds me of double bind, which is right. You know, yeah, and he coined the term. Right, he coined the term double bind. It's in his literature. Although the the technical definition of it varies depending on what you read. I mean, the, the, the shorthand is damned if you do, damned if you don't, but it's yeah. actually more so. Between the rock and a hard place. Yeah. What, what are the other the words that you can use? Between the rock and a hard place. If you do, you're damned. If you don't, you're damned. Right. That's another one. I forgot what it was. My mother used to use the phrase hell's bells. Hell's, hell's bells. bells was, it was sort of a catchphrase for being in the double bind. Although I never really asked her I mean, she probably picked up that expression from, you know, from her parents' generation. Um, and nobody, as far as I know, hardly anybody else ever used that expression. But I sort of understood it to be, it's a mm. double bind. That's her version of double bind. Yeah. yeah, basically, you know, 
you're you're going to be in hell no matter what you do. You're going to be in a you're going to be in a bad spot. No, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. That's hell's bells. I have multiple double binds. You know, I guess the last 30, 40 years, but I had the most when I was in the 30 and 40, I would say that would be the most one. And what I learned after I studied so much about Great Great Basin and all that is like one of the things that affected me the most is like, do you know that teenagers have no double buy? I don't, I don't know that that's true. Well, that's what, you know, somebody claimed, of course. Oh, you know, well, they can claim anything they want. That doesn't mean it's the case. Anyway, well, I, I was using general, that. Yeah, oh. young, younger people would be, take more risk in general than older yeah. people. So I, I'm curious about what you learned about from Bateson. Yeah. What I learned from, after having a heavy discussion, one of my employees it was a classmate with, with me in the NLP class, and his name is Rory Wells, and he passed away. Really. Anyway, what he said was, because teenager has so much energy, he just bulldozed over both double binding decisions. I mean, you can think of it as you because you don't really care about the risk or you have so much energy that the only reason you get in the double one is we are, you're weak in the, making the right, the, you, are, you have don't have in, you don't have enough energy to go through that risk evaluation or whatever you call yeah. it, you're stuck. It's called cavalier. Being cavalier uh, is the term of art for taking a risk where you don't really bother to, to assess the risk. You just go ahead and do it kind of blindly. And so... So the cavalier attitude is what the hell? I'm just you know, yeah. The young, the go young, ahead, go ahead and find out. <laughs> Let's do it yeah. and find out what happens. <laughs> yeah, the young, the young, uh, the what I call the the teenagers version. My my version after I struggled with it for like almost ten years was one of the big decisions I have to do. The thing was, you know, in the LLP we have a strategy. That you you put yourself in the second position and the third position and the fourth position, the fifth decision. I got up to 50, I think it was 52 or 57, I forgot. But anyway, let's say 52. I was in my 52 position, which means that 52, the 52, 52nd position was looking at the 51st, 51st was looking at looking at 50. That's you diminish the effects of the double mind affecting your decision making. If it makes sense to you. So, I didn't, I didn't parse that. I, I okay, let me that. try it one more time. So um, let's say you and I have a double bind. So we introduce Eric in the, the as Eric's position. So now that's called a third position. They're looking at us arguing or something along that line, right? Then Eric still didn't solve the problem because he got, he somehow his interest was tangled or mingled into our decision, it's contaminated, whatever you call that. Now Sam come in and Sam look at Eric's and Eric's look at you and me. And it's like, okay, same situation happened. Sam have also have contaminated, cause, cause, what do you call that? Uh, it's turtles all the way down. Turtles <laughs> all the way down, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's turtles all the way down. There's an infinite regress. There's, there's actually a, a, a some interesting logic puzzles based on either infinite regress or very large number of finite regress. The one with the, the the black and the white hats and they're all lined up 100 in a row or something. And there's some really classic logic puzzles which have solutions, but but you have to do a a, a nearly infinite regress, except yeah. they, they do bottom that's, out. That's what I'm yeah. saying. I got up to 50 second, 50 seconds positions like, Okay, I finally can breathe and be able to look at the problem, the situation in a clear mind that I can, you know, apply my yeah. the, logic. The, the tower of Hanoi bottoms out after n disks. If you have an n disk thing, you can recurse down to n times, and then it does bottom out. And sometimes you don't know if it's going to bottom out. You can't. You don't really know if there is a finite n <laughs> below which it, you hit the ground floor. And of course, hell is by definition where it never bottoms out. <laughs> and hell is basically an infinite regress that never bottoms out. Yeah, the Chinese version have 18 levels. Oh, uh, yeah. Isn't that from Dante's Inferno has... 18? I don't remember. Dante's Inferno has a finite number. And they're all named. Yeah. Have you ever seen Dante's Inferno? It's He's got actually a model. Uh, and, and everyone, and they have funny names. I, I even wrote it up. Let me just get the link here. I wrote this up one time. Um, actually, it's a bit of a joke, but nonetheless, it's, let's see. Um, where do I find it here? 
while we're waiting on what I, the concept I was thinking about, it's called old pain. And this came up on a podcast where middle-aged hosts were talking to a young a woman who had a very interesting career. And um, because she didn't have any of the old pain that these computer programmers struggled through for 20 years or so, she had a fresh mind to be more risky and to think creatively and put together things that we wouldn't imagine because uh, we, we would just talk ourselves out of using the newer technologies creatively because we know, oh, we've been through all this pain before. 10 levels of hell. Yeah, it, it, it's basically a, a a send up that I got from um, the magazine. That, oh, look at it. Not the magazine, but the. And I guess when we started, I heard you talking about do we have free will, and um, the onion. But yeah, what I was thinking is um, maybe long term we don't, but short term the little random decisions that we make. Uh, that's our free will. But yeah. long term, we're probably follow all following a path. When you look back, <laughs> well, maybe that's where um, what's the guy's name? Jeez, I can't pull the Stanford professor. Um, I tell you, I just can't pull back pull up names anymore. <laughs> but well, um, this one here, anyway. You, you don't you talk do about well. it. anyhow. He's on the cover of um, one of the periodicals this month on a kind of he wrote a book about we don't have free will but it may be that in the near term and the long term that is is at the time horizon that you you take the present worth of the future whatever mm -hmm. and you but you only can do it for a certain time horizon and maybe the longer you go out on the time horizon um the less freedom you feel you have because you you may win in the short term, but you're going to lose in the long term. Mm -hmm. The question is, at what point is the long term so far out that you don't give a damn anymore? And typically it's, it's well, I'll be dead by then. <laughs> so, so a politician who's in their 70s will make a decision that will have bad consequences in 30 years, but he don't care because he'll be dead by then. <laughs> and he doesn't really, he doesn't really consider whether or not his children and grandchildren are going to suffer. I look at it from, yeah, if I may, thank you. if I may, I look at it from, let's say, let's say you make a decision that's 10 parameters that you need to consider, right? So that's one level. Then each of the levels that you're making decision was, you know, it's restricted or controlled by karma, whatever the consequences of that created that scene yeah. or that condition that you're in right now, the situation you're stuck with, whether it's a bounce check, whether it's a credit card that is no longer working or whatever that the, the consequences is. So out of 10, you know, 10 uh, parameters that you're making your decision on, it's all controlled by karma, right? Let's use a simple word of consequences. Okay, so then you can't change any of them because you cannot go back and change any of the 10 parameters as considered as, you know, decision-making, ultimate decision depend on. Then where the hell's the choice? Yeah, you can also think about it in terms of machine learning. Like the machine, it's dependent on the corpus of input. So it can identify the 10 variables, but yeah. it'll act based on what it's been fed. And uh, we've yeah. seen AI go wrong, like Microsoft's uh, chatbot from years ago. Yeah. yeah, I mean, unless you can go with you. I mean, that, that again, as, as I said earlier, when you change the machines, <laughs> you go from GDP to BART or whatever that mm -hmm. the other machine, or different software change. You change something that change one of the parameters, change something. That's right. Or you you added like I'm talking about the the day trader. They have a different parameter that you and I cannot think about. That's you know a shame. I, they, I'm ashamed of. So they put shame into the parameter. Now you got eleven parameters. Of course, when you change the the structure, the behavior got changed. I've no question about it. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, the more the more variables you throw into the mix, the different the different 
will be the value of the function that you compute. And at some point you leave variables out because you don't know what what numerical value to assign to them. So you leave them, they could be big. You know, it could be that that some variable that you don't know is the difference that makes the difference. Right. But you, you, don't, have, you don't know what it is. Which is why we live in a chaotic society because there's, there's a lot of variables that will make a difference that you have no way to reckon them. Yeah, and not only that, you also have misinformation, right? Yeah, we're going to have an exponential it, increase in misinformation <laughs> now because of time. AGI. It takes, it takes a lot of time and effort to evaluate information, to determine if it's reliable and accurate or, or misleading or bogus. And at some point you say, there's so much information, disinformation, misinformation, and bogosity that, you know, I don't have enough processing power to process it, to, you know, to sort it all out. I'm, I'm trying to sort an infinite number of factors, and I can't sort an infinite number of factors, so I'll just roll the dice. That's why you mean you don't have a choice. <laughs> well, that may be what Sapolsky means. I don't really know. I haven't, I haven't studied his thesis to, to why he disbelieves we have free will. But he's, 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 he's pretty, claims to be pretty certain about it. Whereas other re other writers that I've read, Smolian and and um, Isaac Bashevis Singer and others, have just uh, convincing arguments that we do have free will. And and I have adopted a definition such that under my definition we do have free will. Again, my summer my my simplest version of it is if you got ten parameters and you cannot change any of the parameters, to go back and change it, you know, even the nanosecond perspective, then you're stuck with whatever the consequences you have given at that moment in time, and therefore your decision could be exactly the same thing if you do this again, again, and again. But the thing that changes is your age. So the thing what, is, that's one much, parameter that changes. That doesn't count. <laughs> how, how much future do you have left to receive the payoff or the or the uh, cost? So you know, depending on how what I do the next two hours. <laughs> the thing is, is that I I think your time horizon really does is one of the parameters that's relevant. You know, if if you're a youngster and you got you know decades ahead of you, expected decades ahead of you, that. That's one thing. And if you're in your 80s and you've got maybe months ahead of you, you know, yeah. it may be a, a factor that says, don't take the risk because, you know, I, I can't, re I don't have time to recover if it's, if I screw it up. So right. kids say, well, I can screw up and I can fail. I can recover. I got plenty of time to recover. So in other words, saying that if you have 10 parameters and one of the parameters is time, and time is a variable, you cannot make it into a constant, right. then you do have a choice. Then you, then that one you thing, one it, becomes, it becomes a relevant factor. You know, in fact, if, you, if you're looking at medical decisions, there's an age beyond which they won't try to correct a medical problem because it's, number one, it takes too long to correct it relative to your life expectancy and or there's too big a risk that it will end your life early. So, you know, people will make a different medical decision depending on whether you're a youngster or an oldster. Yeah, but if you're the only patient that's perfect case of trying the, the trial medication, <laughs> you may be use it as a, you know, sample data. Yeah, so, but yeah, my observation though is that the time horizon really is a, a factor that is very, very hard to reckon and can be very significant if you were able to reckon it. Well, we'll come, well, good morning, Sam, you finally awake. Thanks for all the posting on the Bohemian Dialogue on Facebook page. I'm noticing it. Yeah, we just posted a ton of stuff in the-, in the uh, I'm finding that we don't practice Pregnant pauses. You need to go back to, you tell, put a ton of stuff in Messenger, which I haven't looked at. Code of conduct for serious conversation in the spirit of that.
Oh, yeah, you, were here, no, you were not here yesterday. The, the summary I got out of yesterday was two sentences. One is that, you know, one of them is, uh, I forgot. <laughs> Bohemian's dialogue is useful when in the scientific discussion style. If you are going somewhere, you have a discussion. Scientific discussions is the you know the structure of that. And the second one was is you have in the debate. You know, if you're in the combatant that kind of thing, then then Bohemian dialogue is useful. Other than that, it's not very useful. And oh, by the way, oh, you have to forget about Bohemian dialogue structure while you're in the Bohemian dialogue. Otherwise, you <laughs> cannot be in the Bohemian dialogue. It's not, bo it's not Bohemian dialogue. It's Bohemian. Bohemian. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, Bohemian. Bohemian is a different word. No, yes. sorry, Bohemian. Yeah. Yeah, but I get too excited. Yeah. I sort of forget the definition of bohemian. It's sort of that would come to mind. For well, whatever reason, you see, that was I don't have a choice. I have to use that word. Sounds about the same to me. But they're very different. I mean, you know, homonyms or near homonyms, homonyms can uh, they're very funny because they they can dramatically change the meaning if you get the wrong uh, put the accent on the wrong syllable. It changes yeah. the whole meaning. So, so here's an example of language getting in the way. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, Sam. Go for it, Sam. So I've invited people here to explore rational, systems-based, model-based, mathematical, scientific, critical reasoning. I don't view this as a forum for debate. I do think it's a pursuit for truth and a refinement of these models. So I did not participate yesterday. So how does this particular approach, if we're looking at it in the way that I described just now, lend itself or not lend itself to Bovian principles? I don't know, because I, I haven't done the information processing task to resolve that. Also the role of the moderator was there a moderator yesterday or no? I'm sort of my moderator. I keep bringing the subject back and asking different perspectives of the questions, of the structures. We were very yeah. moderate yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't watch it yet. So, yeah. So, you want to summarize what we have done yesterday? Barry, you're probably good at that. I give you a rough idea and outline what I say earlier. Uh, I, well, no, because I'd have to go back and watch it again and refresh my memory, which I read, read the AI transcript or something. Yeah. I don't know. I, mean, I did get a summary <clears throat> from Zoom. Yep. But I wasn't able to incorporate the entire thing in the description of the video when I uploaded it to YouTube. So I included 5,000 characters approximately because that's how many you're limited to in YouTube. So that description is actually there as part of the announcement for the video. What was the thing you put in a messenger just now? That was another. In messenger, I asked multiple different uh, language models to create a code of conduct for serious conversation based on Bohemian principles. And oh, the, I see. Oh, yeah, Bard. Various different models came up with. Yeah, it's in, it's in three-point font, so I really have to get on my magnifying glass to read that. But, Couldn't you? Okay. No, I don't think it's three-point font. You can actually click on you it. You can maximize the screen. The yeah. picture. Do you want to share the screen and show us quickly? Yeah, yeah I can do that. Let's see. I've got to go back to here. Yeah, I think there's also something about a visual aid when you're analyzing a dialogue like this. All right. So you see that? Yeah. Yep. So this mm -hmm. is the first, this is the first of what half, well, five right. or six ones. This is blown up as much as I can blow it up. I don't know if you can. Yeah, read it. I can read it. Yeah. And then, so then if I go to the next one, now that's that one. Now there's the next one. Come on, come up. There it is. So that's, Vicu is Vicuna another LLM? Yes. Well, I don't remember coming across one called L. Called there you can use the right arrow key on the right hand side instead of the minimizing. Go back. Yeah, use the right arrow, arrow, left arrow. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. See the right arrow showed up. Oh, over here. Yeah, mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, click on it. Yeah, that will change it to the next one. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then well, this is also Vicuna. There are multiple Vicunas, just like yeah. there are multiple Llama 2Bs. Oh. Right. And then Llama 2, that's the new one that just came out a month or two ago. And then that's also Llama 2. Yeah, they're hosted by different services. Oh. And there's a train. Wizard is I haven't heard of this one either. Wizard LL. Wizard LM. Yeah. And any more? Notice some of them are incomplete. You yeah. chat. I guess that's the last one. So there's you chat and go backwards. Okay. Mm -hmm. You chat, your wizard LM. We have Llama 2, also Llama 2, Vicuna, another Vicuna, and then Bard. And that's it. That's all. Mm -hmm. So reputedly, the new bard theoretically is based on Gemini. So I was curious about that particular one. The Gemini Pro, not the not the yeah, not the ultimate. But, yeah. Yeah. So, were you able to confirm that this really is the new Gemini? You can't really tell just looking at its uh, output. Yeah, I don't know how to tell either. You can ask it. I guess, yeah, I guess you have to ask it. Are you Gemini or something yeah, like that? Yeah. It will tell you. But see, I mean, actually, uh, I'm curious about this claim that Bumian dialogue is useless. I don't know that it's useless. It's just uncommon. It, it's difficult to sustain it with the average person. That You can sustain it with somebody who's dedicated, but most people aren't dedicated. Well, we aren't even dedicated. We are all of these principles. Because we haven't really been trained in it. You have to be trained in it. And oh, wait a minute. Wait, no, 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 Barry. Barry. We can be trained this. in it? We can read this, and without training, we can already tell whether we're following these principles or not. Oh, well, maybe. No, it's very easy. I, 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 don't, know that I, I don't know that I could. Okay, let me ask you one, okay? Yeah. Do we use silence intentionally? I don't know. Do we? We don't. How would I know? How would I know? Because there's no I silence. Know. No, there's there. Well, there there are periods of silence. We had a, no, there aren't. I don't know if it was yesterday or last week. We had a very long period of silence. Um, Jerry Mikalski's meeting has no silence. moments of silence. Mm. I recall. A passage of silence where we just sat there and stared at each other for, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds. Today? I don't, I don't know if it was intentional, just nobody had anything to say. That's different than letting the last thing basically sink into our consciousness. Yeah, well, maybe that's what it was, but how would you know? You would know yourself. So, like comparing it to Jerry Mikowski's meeting, like if people, um, volunteer, they raise their hand if they want to share, they share, and then there's maybe 30 seconds before the next person shares or more, if, depending on uh, what they, if they say something poignant. And, and it's really when the group is ready, so it's more like a Quaker meeting type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, if it's a Quaker meeting, you have silence is a feature that's common. Yeah, the, there was one call where it turned into a Quaker meeting. It's not usually that way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the answer is I don't really know how to how to assess that. Okay, but I think we do have things like non-judgment and equity equality. Um, well, that I don't know that, that certainly wasn't true in the past. Yeah, have we evolved to that? Well, I think it's a function of who's present. Okay. If every if you respect everybody who's present, then yes. And if there are people present who you wish they weren't there, well, what you know, who let who let him in the room, right? <laughs> then um, yeah, and and the state of mind of people varies. So, yeah. So I posted something on the chat. So Kay Rinlaw is one of my dear friends for mm -hmm. about twenty five years. She's a uh, author for many books about listening. And I have her certify my listening skill, whether I'm okay or not okay in, while I was in Brazil with her. 
And you can see from the Amazon search that I put in the secret out of listening, all that, all that stuff. She's heavily, heavily influenced by Bohemian Dialogue because she privately messaged me that that's what she used to build her career from that. So I can invite her to our conversation if you want. <laughs> I was thinking oh, about that this morning. I would love that. <laughs> so like if you sent her this video, she could say everything we're doing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you look at the, let me see if I can give you the her yeah. link on the Facebook. Oh. Yeah, she's a very dear friend of mine. Yeah. You, you know the term echo chamber as applied to a, it's more like an echo chamber, a very small group of people is an echo chamber. Because you don't get fresh perspectives. And yeah. that's one of the problems that a small organization ends up being an echo chamber. Not necessarily. Common, commonly. But Not guaranteed, but commonly. If and I think small remember. groups have got turned into echo chambers. And I know I'm interrupting you, so that's one of the anti boom <laughs> <laughs> I want to yeah. cut that off. It's very limiting to say this is X and then just assume it's true. We do that a lot here. We well, don't. I, mean, I, can, I could assign a, a probability or a, or a fractional percentage of time, but oh. then I have to figure out what's the fractional percent. I don't know the fractional percent. Oh. Oh. I have a better idea. Just design a last language model to evaluate our conversation in the in the spirit of Boolean dialogue. In, in fact, the... I asked AI companion to do that, and AI companion says I can't do that. Did it say why? Yet, it, yet, did, it, yet. Did, it, did it explain why it couldn't? What's the impediment? Okay, I'll tell you what it says. Okay, I said <laughs> after the session is over, send me a summary of how well we practice principles of Bohemian dialogue. Okay, so I was hoping that it would wait until we're done, but it answers me immediately at eight twenty-seven a.m. Pacific time. It says, "I'm sorry, but the meeting transcript does not provide any information about how well the participants practice the principles of Bohemian dialogue. Therefore." I cannot provide a summary on that specific topic. Is there anything else I can assist you with? It's basically the dumbest response I've ever seen from a language model. So you asked it to do the work, and it says, I can't do the work at all. I can only report what other people already said. It has to match it to a corpus that okay. can reason through it. To know yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. It, it does, it's not a columnist that can... It would need examples of Bohemian dialogue in transcript form that it could match to and compare. Yeah. Now, AGI, I've heard a comparison like taking AlphaGo and integrating it with the LLMs. And uh, I saw the movie about AlphaGo, which was fascinating. And uh, the question is, yeah, what would... Would an AGI be able to do that? That's or that's the that's the game go. Yeah, the taking game the game go. go. There was a competition between the a master from Korea at Go and the computer. Um, Wolfram developed. Wolfram's Alpha versus a human. Um, I forget which company made that computer. I mean, the question is: Is the Alpha Wolfram's Alpha or a different Alpha? Yeah, I think it's a different Alpha. Uh, okay, that's that's what confused me. I'm fine. okay. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wolfram Alpha has been around 20, 30 years, and it's referring. Yeah, but see, Alpha Go could be something that Wolfram put together. I don't know. It isn't something else. It's independent of Wolfram's Alpha. Yeah, it was an independent company that just studied the game of Go and uh, built a model that Fine defeated. Technologies. What is it? Google. Oh, it's a Google project. Yes, it was a company oh. called DeepMind that got acquired yeah. by Google. Yeah. Okay. And they go different the different strategy than the chess one. That's all I know. And the chess one is they they figure out all the steps that can be taken and and all that. But Go is too the 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 infinite possibility, so they cannot use that strategy. They have to use a different strategy. This is exactly what the driverless car on. Tesla is doing right now. It's like, I don't want to figure out all the things that can go wrong and do the safest step, but I'd rather to use the most, the best driver, what they would do, and I'll use that from that perspective. Yeah, so that's it, like a deep learning model, really going deeply into this right. the game of Go. And so if you apply that to chat GPT and combine it, then it is that's the theory that that's what was going on 
at OpenAI that they sort of integrated those two concepts together and sort of achieved AGI, but we don't know what to believe yet. The, the, yeah. chess, one, the chess one was called Deep Thought. Deep Mind is the company that made yeah, Alpha. Mind, deep Thought and Deep Crud. I think more often than not, we're in Deep Crud. Sounds good. <laughs> Another metaphor I can think of the best way I can explain to someone with an IEO brain or something along that line would be, you know how we do the 99 plus 99, instead of doing the 99 plus 99, do all the carry over and all that math, you say, well, it's 100 plus 100 minus 2, something yeah. like that. This that different route. That's all yeah. it is. Yeah, numeracy. Yeah. How people think about numbers. Yeah. Yeah, same same concept. Instead of so they switch from the ninety nine plus ninety nine step, and now they switch on hundred minus two steps on the for the goal perspective. That's the two yard the two yard line instead of the ninety eighth yard line. <laughs> yeah, this makes more sense to talk about the two yard. You know, it's it's third down and two yards to go to the goal line. You know? so and I found the language that we have is a lot of time we use the word no or don't do that, don't think of the color red. <laughs> you got us into trouble. So you could invite this uh, Kay Lindahl, and maybe that would answer. Yeah, so I can have her see if she's free next weekend. And, and, and yeah, she's again a very dear friend of mine for 20 plus years, 25 or 25 years. Yeah. So my question for Sam is, can you point out when we're not following Bohmian principles as it's happening in a meeting? Yeah, I could. Yes. Or either Sam. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think the problem. I can see a thermometer that's going up and down with yeah. the. <laughs> so I'm going to go down the list for you based on what I know. Okay, let's try that. So let's use the let's use the first one here. I'm going to use. Okay, there's the first one. Okay, and I don't like the first one. Let's use the second. The second one, active listening. Okay, so like we can have numbers. It's a lot easier to refer to a number. Active listening. When two persons are talking to each other, they open their mouth and they start talking. That's why you don't have the active listening. That's number one. We almost never do active listening. <laughs> I mean, have we ever done? Yeah. Let me go down the list. Let me go down the list. Well, judgment, substantial adjustment. When when you have substantial adjustments, that means you you put your head together and you listen. You you open your eye and you won't look at the each other's face. You yeah. you know you you don't have any judgment. Judgment means like. As soon as you make any funny faces, like that, you know you have a judgment. Then you're you're not suspending your judgments. Okay. So so if you say not necessarily, that's already a judgment. <laughs> Number three, share inquiry. What is it? Say it again. Share inquiry. Share shared inquiry. 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 Shared shared inquiry. inquiry. Oh, that we both ask the same question collectively. But this one should engage in the elaborate field. So, oh, so yeah, rather than I mean? to prove each other an argument. So it's like, you're right, I'm right, you're right, all right. So it's like, we, sh we have a common goal and we coming from the same perspective. Until we do that, we don't have a shared inquiry. Honesty and vulnerability number four, which is the most difficult one. Honesty is that when you don't know something, you say you don't know something. When you, you're not sure about something, you say, no, you're not sure about something. Vulnerability means that you say, well, I'm terrible at that. And Barry does that. Well, all, well I was like, I don't know, but I kind of recall that. So that we do that. I would say we have a at least an A minus, no question about it here. Now, Number five. On that question, um, do large language models have honesty and vulnerability? Do they admit when they're, they they're, don't They know? have no capability of doing that because you need yeah. to know yeah, so it's like you. If you point it out, if you point out that they said a, and then a paragraph where they said okay. not a, they'll recognize that's true, and then they'll say, "Well, I'm sorry if I confused you," but they won't resolve between which of a and not a is the is the correct thing to assert. Right. And do you think it should try to identify when it's hallucinating? Do you think it can bracket off? This is a, a speculation. Well, you, you cannot mm -hmm. go. You cannot do that, Eric. So the way that if you think of this way, when you're talking a conversation with someone and you want to see if this person on honest with you or not, there are many parameters you need before you can can have that yep. qualification of that. So you look at the face, facial expression. You know them in the historical day, for example. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to Barry about medical things that he he's not familiar with, and he's telling me like he knows what he's talking about. So you need to know historical. 
knowledge that he has. So again, they have parameters that you have to have in order to have assessment on honesty. So how much you trust them in the previous conversation and all that stuff. So again, it's parameter that they don't have. Last language model have no way to have that information. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what Sam, Sam, you did you, that? Sam Han, did you want to comment? Or? You had your hand We're up. Asking a large language model to apply the principles of Bohmian dialogue. We're not in dialogue necessarily with an LLM. We're in dialogue with each other. Each of us, at least today, as far as I can tell, are human and not LLM. I think I did do a Bohmian dialogue with an LLM. Let me see if I can find it. I We're I even... still on Sam Chan's uh evaluation of each of these principles see this is what happens here we get distracted too easily we move off focus and that's one of the things that happens when we're not listening actively have i mentioned lately i have a listening disability <laughs> if you say that too often you start to believe it well no it's been true for 76 years see that's another Separate topic. <laughs> Let me tell you something about active active listening. So it's an illusion. Let me put it this way. When I was in, that was a 10th grade, 11th grade, I was taking my favorite, favorite physics class in the classroom. You know what I noticed was? If I pay full attention to my teacher, I could, don't get it. I, I, I lost it. But if I put a storybook or anything, the comedy book or whatever it is under my table and he, she doesn't see it, so I got two things going on at the same time, I can get it 100%. <laughs> so it's like, what the hell is happening? So I thought, I got too much bandwidth, I got too much energy, so I need to consume it somewhere else, sort of like, you know, unless I, dis unless I what's called, a, release some air from my tires, my, my tires going to blow up or something all night. So I... I so I did that from then on the last couple for the for the 10th grade and 11th grade or 11th and 12th grade. It works really well for me. Just to give an idea. Again, I'm not trying to tell you what I know. This is what my personal experience that detected. When you have too much attention, that's why a lot of smart kids in the classroom they get bored and they start to create troubles. Okay. Unless you know the let me do what, what I think I just heard, okay? When I was in fourth grade. I did reasonably well. So when I went to fifth grade, people thought I was going to do just as well. But it turned out they thought I had a learning disorder. They actually said, we're going to have to move you back to fourth grade. They told this to my parents because he's not paying attention. My parents decided to say, well, you know, let's see if we can actually evaluate this. So they had the school psychologist give me a test. And I tested way above fifth, sixth, or seventh uh, level, okay? So they said, I was just getting bored by what was being discussed in fifth grade. So they moved me to sixth grade, which is why I tell people I don't even have a fifth grade education, <laughs> okay? Now, that little summary that took about a minute, unfortunately, distracted us from the original course of conversation, right? But it's something that was personal. It's something that I was triggered by, to hear that, hey, something happened when I was a child, okay? Sam said, this happened to me. I said, oh, this happened to me. So this, if we were really following Bohemian dialogue, I would not have done what I just did. But what I just did is a case of what happens a lot in this and Saturday conversations. Now, I'm being particularly uh, pokey today. I don't know why. Maybe I didn't get much sleep. But I'm really trying to pursue this quest of can we apply Bohemian principles positively and productively? And so I'm trying to push back at these cases where, oh, we can't really apply it because it's too hard or we don't do it or, you know, we're not trained in it or whatever. I'm trying to push back at those principles. OK, sure. We're not going to easily find, unless you're Sam Chan, a trainer of Bohemian principles. But we can each read these things and we can each, I think, ascertain whether or not we're actually applying these things. I don't believe that's beyond our ken. So I don't think it's appropriate. In fact, I think it's probably intellectually lazy to say, we're not trained, so we're not going to do it. I am intellectually lazy.
And I think if we're having trouble with this, imagine what kids who are constantly distracted, <laughs> how, how could they have, have ever figure this out? And yet Sam's friend Kay has made a career of this. Yep. Yep. So people want this. She can train them. Evidently, she's successful because her career spans four decades. You know, people do want this. And I'm trying to figure out why is it that we don't want this? Because we're intellectually lazy. <laughs> and that would be sad. Okay, I will probably that's, that's, well, have, have you noticed how I'm depressed all the time? <laughs> There's I'm a resistance. Why are we resistant? What's psychologically yeah. Why going on? To these principles. Let me let me give you my perspective for today's conversation. If you go back and watch it again. Okay, so my strategy was you need to check in. You know, how are you doing? All that stuff. So you, people have to go through whatever is on their chest. Otherwise, you cannot put them into discussion or whatever. So during the check-in period, I was going to figure out what to be a good topic to to float around in the Bobian dialogue style, right? So that's what we were going to the stages of doing that. But again, as I say repeatedly, I'm not sure you noticed say, me saying that. I check myself against the list every time I have a dialogue before and after. We call that pre-check and, you know, closing, you know, all that stuff, just checking to make sure I'm going through all that stuff. And most of the time I would say I'll get a B plus, A minus, that kind of thing. So once in a while, I just want to have fun with it and screw the the structure and then just do it my way and all that, see how it goes. So the most important thing about conversation is always having fun, laughters and, you know, poking at each other's. Otherwise, when you don't have fun, your two structure will be too dry and people doesn't last very long because just too dry. That's why we have music in the car <laughs> to keep us entertained, you know, and we have companion in the car to keep us happy and all that stuff. So, it's really important to keep those basic structure outside Bohemian dialogue to entertainment value, entertainment, whatever you call that, revenue, to keep us going. So go for it. Okay. So you'll notice there's only four people in the conversation today. When GCC started, we typically had 12, sometimes 16 people. Okay. I believe, for better or for worse, that I have driven those people away. We thought I drove them away. Uh, let's fight about that, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> but the anyway, record is on the video. The record is on the video. You can go back. Right. And watch it. It's in these seven or eight hundred videos. Okay, <laughs> they constantly oh. come back to the themes that interest me, which are how do we engage? How do we become more productive by understanding each other's ideas? How do we apply these Bohemian dialogue principles? How do we decide whether or not interrupting people is good or productive for the conversation or not? Do we come in and leave our assumptions or do we actually actively lean into other people's statements? Do we ask clarifying questions? Do we have pregnant pauses so that these statements by others who are very profound can sink into my consciousness rather than me just, you know, understanding one word and triggering and firing back with, you know, whatever was top of mind for that one word. I'm constantly asking these questions. So when people say my truth, whatever I say, okay, is that really your truth or is that your experience? Are you talking about truth with a little case T or truth with a capital T? I keep asking these questions and those questions have over the years, I've noticed, caused people to not return. And I blame myself for that. But it's because I'm trying to find a group of people who, as I introduced to each of you, I believe, who really value model-based thinking, systems thinking, scientific reasoning, mathematics, you know, critical reasoning, uh, collaborology principles. I'm really trying to find a group of people who appreciate this, okay? For me, that's fun because that, to me, doesn't exist widely in this world. I'm trying to find a group of people who can appreciate and practice these principles. Because if you do, then that's the community I'm trying to build. That to me is fun. That to me has this time frame of, are we gonna make it or are we not? That's the question for this time frame. So it's not about whether or not, you know, we're having brownies and giggling. That's a different kind of fun. The fun for me is trying to experiment mentally with a group of like-minded people or similarly-minded people to try and look at what we could do differently 
And right now we haven't been exemplars. We can bring up these Bohmian principles. We can say we like them, but then weeks later we say, oh, they're useless. So to me, that's puzzling. And that's why I want to lean into this and really, really question. Now, if that leaning in pisses you off, I apologize. But it's really sincere inquiry. I really am trying to understand this. Over. I would say go back to the structure create behavior. If we strictly follow the Bohmian dialogue structure, what behavior we have and what kind of feeling when we walk away from this dialogue we're going to have. So that was a use that going away feelings to grade you say, well, that was an enlightenment. That was, you know, a piss off conversation. That was like, I would never come back to this conversation. So that would, that would be your grading, you know, that that's your thing of like final exam, give it, have 90% of the weight. So I heard Sam talking about his desire and um, I'm also questioning like, where does Engelbart fit into this? Because I think he, he was like doing a scientific study of how people work together. And uh, now you're seeing how we get off on topics like LLMs because there's, there's a technology piece in our mind. And it's a new technology that can bring people together or it can divide us more. And uh, yeah, so I mean, the other the years I've seen Sam really trying to get to this place where he, he has people productively discussing things. And uh, yeah, but I guess the natural tendency is we're all so distracted with so many things these days. We And when we get together, it's like, oh, hi, nice to see you again. And uh, we, we're in our own minds, but we're trying to find some common ground. Yeah. I appreciate that observation. Mm -hmm. In very subtle ways and sometimes inconsistently, uh, but because I'm trying different things. I am really trying to keep the original principles from 2017 at play. And most of the time people coming here would say it's a failure because it's not happening. But I'm trying to understand why it's not happening, okay? Because if we believe all these good principles and we believe all these 90 or so different uh, things that people say they're gonna do at conversations and yet we can see how frequently these things aren't done, I'm still asking, can we as humans actually learn well? We don't appear to. And this might be Sapolsky's point. You know, we don't have free will. We don't want to do what we say we want to do. I'm not ready to give up on that yet. I think, bit... sorry, let me take, make one more statement, okay? I think there is a need for a small group of people to learn how to behave and level up their behavior. Otherwise, if we can't do it, what, 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 what chance do we give ourselves to survive? Okay, if we're not gonna level up and actually look at things, you know, from a, a really, really deeply collaborative way. And I'm not saying Bohemian Principles is the only way. But I'm saying it's one way we thought was going to get us there, but we really haven't even tried it. And if we can't do that, then what right do we have to criticize, you know, what else is going on in the world? We don't, actually, because we're part of the problem. Over. Thank you. Based on what you just said, the way that I go by as a CEO of the company, I, my strategy is about what can, what's the most efficient way to get this thing done and if it's doable and all that stuff. So that's why if you go back, I would say a couple of weeks back, maybe Barry, uh, that I asked a question about why did he fail after he tried this for so many years and what caused him to fail? So what that's why I asked about 
What's what kind of dollar is appropriate? What kind of dollars is not appropriate? What which part of his field? I'm more I'm more interested to learn from him what he did because he went through twenty years of trying to do this and he got pissed off and he moved to Latin America, whatever that was. I'm more interested to say what have you done so far. The more I can learn from other people that they have spent so much time on it. It will give me a better, a good start. And maybe he did something wrong. Maybe he did something right. Maybe he was, was you know, all that stuff. He driven a lot of friends. So again, he's a scientist. He's a physicist, right? So he's 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 great. But he's he have an agenda. That you and I don't have it on a daily life. And it was useful for him because when he have a scientific study that he wanted to have a, you know, his physicist mate or whatever you call that, he's in the scientific team. Then this Bohemian dialogue stock structure will be very clear, see things clearly, open-minded, vulnerable, pay attention to each other saying, because every little thing is important in this case. But for us, we have too many variables. We're dealing with humanity. We're dealing with human. We're dealing with walls. We're dealing with all the topics that what just Ben was saying. Because we have a parameter of time, you know, we got to do. It's nothing to do with physics. Physics is, is constant. Everything is constant in physics. As well as human being, nothing is constant. So it's like, okay, go for it. Not just applying these principles to physics. In fact, that's the last. In my understanding, he was trying to bring these principles to the rest of the world. I mean, notice that he had many conversations with famous non-physicists, right? Krishnamurti, I think, was one of them, right? And so uh, Einstein had a conversation with Tagore. And uh, there's many, many cases where physicists are actually incorporating uh, inquisitive inquiry, maybe not exactly Bohemian Dialogue, but at least a deeply appreciative uh, conversations with non-physicists. So this is not just applicable to physics. This is applicable to every serious field of, of inquiry, of discovery, of examination. And people, I think they're still pretty important. We don't understand people. So when we're asking, why do we do certain things? Why do we in the small or we in the large do certain things? Those are very important questions. Over. Okay, go back to the same question. I'm going to make it simple for you. Why did he fail? I don't know that he failed. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really he know. He gave up. He gave up oh. on his own principle. I raised the question, did he study variations across cultures? Like, did he compare Eastern? I don't know. Uh, I yeah, because that, that would be an interesting uh, study to see, um, does it adapt better in other cultures? And what are those factors? It's uh, not different than when I take a new medication, I want to look at the side effects. Can I handle the side effects? They have interaction with the other side effects. So Bohemian Dialogue is no different than the new medication that we will be taking. Okay, but you know, like here, we're four men in a in a conversation. If we introduced different types of people into this mix, I'm sure it would impact what we talk about and how we talk about it. And because uh, based on the way we grew up, you know, all kinds of preconceptions. Go ahead, Sam. Lama 270B says, okay, I asked these uh, uh, LLMs, this is my prompt. Did David Bohm view his Bohmian principles as a failure? Did he give up on them? Mm -hmm. Lama 270B at LM Sis says, David Bohm did not view his Bohmian principles as a failure, comma, nor did he give up on them. In fact, comma, he continued to develop and refine his ideas throughout his career and his work in the field of quantum physics and philosophy remained influential until his death in 1992. Bohm's ideas about the implicate order and the holo movement were not widely accepted by the scientific community during his time, but they did spark a significant amount of interest and debate. Bohm's work was seen as a challenge to the dominant Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which held that the behavior of subatomic particles was fundamentally probabilistic and could not be described in terms of blah, 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 blah. So anyway, the first statement was, did not view as a failure, continued to work on them until his death. That's not what I hear from Barry. Barry. That's what I'm saying. I'm looking at a number of sources here, and I'm trying to really understand that statement. Did he view 
his word as a failure, this first response and these other ones say no. That is Barry's interpretation that Bohm viewed it as a failure. UChat says, but David Bohm did not view his Bohmian principles as a failure, nor did he give up on them. Okay. And then uh, Bard says, while David Bohm did face challenges in gaining widespread appeal, there's no evidence he viewed them as failure or gave up on them. In fact, he continued to explore and refine these ideas throughout his life. So that's at least three of the ones that I've just read right now. So I'm just trying to figure out, Barry, where did this notion that Bohm thought of his principles as a failure, where did that come from? Vikuna 3B, there's no evidence to suggest that David Bohm viewed his principles as a failure or that he gave up on them. Okay, so that's another one. So that's four out of four so far. So this is a appreciative inquiry. I'm really trying to understand the statement. I'm not just assuming it. I'm actually leaning into it. I'm double clicking on it. So this suggests to me like were his ideas suppressed by the mainstream thinking or yeah, what was there too much controversy that Hmm. Almost every new idea will be scoffed at initially. Mm -hmm. right? We have to look at it in terms of this. No matter whether it's Bohm or anyone else, Archimedes, you know, whatever. Okay, every new idea will be scoffed at by the establishment on first appearance. Okay, so if there's no failure by David Bohm, then the next thing I would introduce would be we do focus on one principle or one dialogue method or whatever called we pick one at a time and practice that for the whole week of one conversation i love it i'm there <laughs> there's a suggestion i think we I mean, look I, I know what to do it's like the question is like do we want to do it is how committed are you going to do it like i'm committed so that i've had these conversations going since october of 2017 and my purpose for these conversations has not changed yeah. I, I mean, we don't care yeah. to come in and tell us what we can do because it's, well, I don't want to deal with big chunk. The bigger the chunk is, the more complicated it is. By the way, anything that's worth doing is worth doing it poorly in the beginning. Exactly. That's why I'm continuing. I know this is the Edison perspective, right? I know I'm going to make a lot of mistakes on the way. And they're here for the world to see. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah, I, mean, I really appreciate the persistence and consistency and all that stuff. So, so that's our Bible. That's our God real. That's our, you know, GPS, true north. I think we've lost Barry, unfortunately. It's frozen. Well, his video is not frozen, but I think he is. Okay, it could be internet or power. No, no, he's overloaded with too many things happening right now. So mm -hmm. let him, let's do a oh. second silence for him. It's just that if I close my eyes, I can listen. If I open my eyes, I'm overloaded with too much information and I yeah. I lose the audio. The audio gets sublimated. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So can we pick one idea? And I'll suggest one. Let's give 10 seconds to Barry and let him practice the silent one. Barry, I appreciate you coming here every single week. I really do. It pushes me. Awesome. <laughs> no, it, it gives me things to think about every week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guilty as charged.
I had a director at Bell Labs who called me into his office and he began with this remark. He said, Barry, he says, you make people think. And I said, Jim, is that good or bad? He didn't answer. He meant it as a criticism. It was a think tank. Here I am in a think tank. And he says, Barry, you make people think. Yeah. Is that good or bad? <laughs> good or bad for the company or his team or the world? You know, it was it good or bad for? <laughs> well, that was the point. It was clearly the way he said it. He meant it as a criticism. Yeah, I mean, if the company's goal is for people not to think and just uh, produce and make money. This is uh, yeah. laboratories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sam. Barry, is it possible he did not mean it as a criticism? It's possible, but unlikely given the circumstances. Because I think someone in such a senior position that is such an esteemed research institution would not have used those words as criticism. But that's, that's why I asked him, because it was very clearly. The fact that he pulled me into his office already is a big deal. After that meeting, in the very next performance review, did you or did you not get a comp increase? Um, I'm trying to remember. I mean, sh not long after that, uh, I was kicked out of Bell Laboratories. Although well, not necessarily for that reason. By that boss or someone else? Well, that's so I'm trying to re see. The thing is, it's so long ago; it's hard to remember. I think he, I think he was the director in charge at the time, but I, I can't be sure anymore because I would have, to, I don't have a way to confirm that. But he might have been the director at the time. Anyway, it was worth asking. Could, yeah, could you talk a little more about what happened before that meeting? Like what was going on in the team that well went... the the main thing that was happening is that the federal government had broken up the bell system. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there was not a single entity to do network planning for. There were now like multiple entities. You had separate operating companies, you had separate long lines, you had separate manufacturers of telephone equipment. And in the network planning division, we were trying to make all the components of the telephone network work compatibly with everything else. And that was basically my responsibility. And after the breakup of the Bell system, we didn't have the authority to do that because we only we didn't we didn't have responsibility for the whole thing anymore. And so the question was, well, now what do we do? How do we do network planning? If there, if there are multiple competing entities right. who are not allowed to talk to, not allowed to collaborate, it was against the law to collaborate wow. with competitors. And we go, how the devil are we supposed to do network planning in this new situation? Yeah, I mean, what Before is the work? role of the team now? Now that it broke up, what is your team's role? Are you just affiliated with one subsidiary or? Well, in, in our, so I was still working for AT&T Bell Laboratories, mm -hmm. not Bellcore. Bellcore was now working for the operating companies. And AT&T Bell Laboratories was essentially working for long lines and and maybe Western Electric, because I, I think Western Electric and long lines were sort of what was left together with Bell Laboratories where I was at. But the problem was is that or number one, we're not allowed to talk to the people at Belcor who were who were our colleagues, <laughs> you know, just before that. And I, I'm thinking, how are we supposed to? How are we supposed to do what what this what network planning division was created to do? 
I would say that the leader is terrible because you need to have soft, for example, HDMI or USB consortium, right? So you need to have an organization that's is the industrious standardization organization that like USB and HDMI, those are the organizations. Well, they try to do that. They try to go back to, um, was it IEEE? There was, they try to go back to some stand, some standards model, some industry standards model. I can't remember the name of the industry standards model, but it was something, it wasn't IEEE. Yeah, IEEE is a, it's a failure because you don't have any proceeding in it, but USB, HDMI was successful because. Yeah. So so the here's the problem. So I, I had deep knowledge of the mathematical models that you use to evaluate end-to-end -end performance, which you then optimal, you then solve them for optimal distribution of, 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 impairments so that you you optimize the thing end to end and now the problem was is that this was proprietary knowledge that i personally had developed and now this proprietary knowledge was essentially owned by at&t or bell laboratories the at&t bell laboratories and now the problem was do do we want to share this methodology with our competitors and there were people who said, we can no longer share our expertise in network planning with the other entities who make up the totality of the telephone network because they're competitors. And I go, then how do we do network planning? And I was sort of talking about double bind. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and what is AT&T's role now? Is it long distance or like just well, is, so is it narrowed? So AT&T owns long lines, but AT&T no longer owns the Bell operating companies, which are the, you know, have the local distribution. So the, so the whole issue was that it's a mess. And we're trying to figure out how to, how to run the telephone network where we suddenly we're all not allowed to talk to each other because we're competitors. And we can't share our know-how because now that's all proprietary. And I'm stuck in like, like, how do I do my job? Yes. Yeah, so what's the problem with people thinking now because of this new structure, organizational structure, if people think in terms of optimization, does that uh, create uh, legal issues? Uh, or if you try to call somebody who you used to work with, you know, <laughs> it, it's an, it was an unknown legal situation because we yeah. didn't it was a, uh, the the legality of it was sort of you no know, who knew it hadn't been tested and so for example i previously i would go to the ice the um go to geneva to the uh cctt that was the that was the un's thing for managing tele telephony worldwide between mm -hmm. between countries and before the breakup of the Bell system, I would go to CCITT meetings and go, okay, America, United States of America has the best managed telephone network on the planet compared to other countries that had the the tele the, the post office was running the phone network in most of the other countries, the PTTs. And they didn't have our level of expertise. And I thought, well, if we want to make international telephony as good as domestic telephony, we had to share our expertise with the foreign company, foreign countries, which weren't competitors. They're just, you know, they're our partners. Mm -hmm. Now, if we share our know-how with foreign countries, we're also sharing it with um, who MCI and uh, SBS, right. whatever the name of the other domestic. Right. So now, now we're going, well, if we want to make international phone service as high quality as domestic, we're also teaching our domestic competitors the same thing, and we're not. We don't want to do that anymore. And I go, how the devil can we function? Mm -hmm. They've made, they've they've locked us into this dysfunctional model, where, you know, my my know how has now become useless. And eventually, they said, okay, yeah, your expertise is too valuable to share. And that means it's useless, so we don't need you anymore.
Yeah. Whenever there are mergers or uh, things like that, uh, yeah, it's uh, individuals. Yeah. <laughs> and now, it was that an impossible situation? And so, I couldn't. I couldn't use my expertise functionally in this post divestiture environment. And everybody was scrambling, trying to figure out, you know, how to save their job. Yep. And as as everyone was scrambling to save their job, I go, how do I do my job? I know what my job is or was, but now you're telling me I'm not allowed to do it. Yes. Yeah, so you weren't willing to reevaluate your position and adjust to the mold. You weren't just gonna give well, up. There, was, there wasn't. There, there was no. Res there was no obvious way. I mean, to my mind, there there was an obvious way to do it, mm -hmm. but it meant sharing our know-how with our competitors, domestic competitors. Yep. And that was basically, we didn't want to do that. I mean, I say we didn't want to do that. There were people at at and who didn't want to do that. So are you allowed to write a book and publish it so <laughs> the whole world knows? And you get well, I mean, the consultant on the on the book. <laughs> I, I mean, first of all, our the models that we were using had been published. They were in the they were in conference papers and other things before before the breakup. They'd been we had published this stuff, but we hadn't sat down and explained it to <laughs> these new competitors. We yeah, that's what I'm saying. You publish a book and now you become the expert in that subject so that people come in. Your competition will come and hire you. you now you got multiple jobs. As a but the thing is, is, at the same time, you see, I'm not allowed to work for the for the SBS or whatever the name of it, or MCI. And I wouldn't yeah. want to anyway, because they were assholes. <laughs> so, the, so the thing was, is that it, they've created not more than double buy. They created an impossible situation. And here was the, here was the, the, the kicker. I had been with Bell Laboratories for 19 years at that point. I was a distinguished member of technical staff. I've been there for 19 years. I was a world-class subject matter expert in this role. And in order to be vested for a pension, you had to be with them for 20 years. <laughs> and at, at 19 years and one month, they said, Barry, we don't need you anymore. Goodbye. Meaning I have no pension. Wow. They do that to a lot of companies will do they that. Cut it's age discrimination and uh well I was yeah. like 41 years old or something. I haven't really seen that. What was the year? 80 43 years old? I think I was 43 years old. Right. But I've seen companies do that too. Um people just about to get their retirement bonus. Oh, here I benefits. am, you know, here I am, world class expert. 19 years experience, distinguished member of technical staff. And they say, we don't know how to use you anymore in this new environment. And we can't figure, we can't justify keeping you on payroll. And oh, by the way, we're going to let you go, you know, one half a year short of being, in, being invested for a pension. Wow. That's bad. Yeah, but that's... The environment Very, you're yeah. in, and the the question is, yeah. So you had a you were forced to reevaluate your career. All right. So, so then, I I go to a headhunter, and a headhunter links me up with a company called Miter, which is right down the street here. Miter was a federally funded R and D center that. could only do work for the government provided that the that the work that the government wanted to do couldn't be put out for competitive bid so there's a there's a there's a niche where some department of the government wants some work done but they don't want to put it out for competitive bid and two companies miter and aerospace were the two federally funded research development centers that were chartered to provide research for these government entities that didn't want to use competitive bid. So then, so I got hired at MITRE. I want to show you something. Hang on a second, go back and find it so I can show it to you.
So I'm gonna do a, a I'm gonna do a screen share here. This is just this morning. Uh, where's the screen share? Here it is. Screen share. There it is. Okay. So this morning I'm I'm reading my uh, news feed on Facebook and I come to a sponsored a, sp a sponsored um, from the Meyer Corporation. And it's, a, it's an ad recruiting uh, people to come to work for them. Oh, what is the omission? Now, <laughs> I decide to add a comment. Right. Go ahead. Who wants to read this out loud? Yeah, I could read it. In 1988, Mitre Bedford offered me a position in the Network Center to work on the proposed NASA Space Station Ground to Space Data Network. In my letter of acceptance, I wrote that I was looking forward to engaging in life-affirming applications of technology. Three months after my start date, Mitre's contract with NASA expired, and the management was obliged to find other projects for me to work on. Alas, none of the remaining available funded projects corresponded to life-affirming applications of technology, and that was the end of my brief career at, career at MITRE. Hmm. The other uh, departments of the government were the Air Force, which had the Electronics Command at, at um, Hanscom Air Force Base, which is also in Bedford, and their project was... The logistics command is basically like, like the Amazon, it's the warehouse that distributing stuff. And they wanted to put in a local area network in their warehouse. They were talking about mid, mid 1980s. And so MITRE had proposed a two megabit coaxial cable local area network architecture, which we were supposed to be evaluating and developing for. And by 1988, guess what was happening in Palo Alto, California? Ethernet? Xerox Park had developed Ethernet. Uh, 10 megabit coaxial cable, which is becoming the new industry standard. And here's Miter developing a two megabit weirdo network, custom designed for the, for the Air Force. And it's a, it's a disaster. Okay. And the other, the other, um, division of the government that was had contracts with MITRE was the CIA. And the CIA had all these photographs and they wanted some way to, to develop software to evaluate these photographs to figure out if there's anything interesting in them. So you've got the Air Force, which is trying to support you know, the defense industry and you got CIA is doing spy work. And uh, none of those seemed very juicy to me. And I didn't consider them life-affirming applications of technology. They were basically death-dealing applications of technology, the military and, and, and the CIA. And the result was is that, you know, after a couple of years, they realized that they're not, they don't do life-affirming stuff there. So anyway, that's, that's what happened to me in the, in, between 1984 and 1990. <laughs> the government blew it blew up my career <laughs> essentially unless i wanted to do defense work so that's what you i see sam has his hand up i'm hearing maybe it's only impinging on my consciousness for the first time that our lives could have intertwingled twice earlier because again i'm going to go on a small digression from 80 to about 1982, I was working for TRW and the project was called SOGS, S-O-G-S. SOGS stood for Science Operations Ground Station. It was the telemetry and data management solution for the Hubble Space Telescope. Here you go, same deal. TRW got that contract. And I remember, uh, I think it was Griffith, or Griffiths Air Force Base, I think it was um, somewhere in Virginia or Alabama that actually went. 
and visited as part of that uh, contract. Anyway, so TRW was doing something that you hardly ever hear about these days. It was doing systems engineering for that network. It's trying to say, okay, so if this shot up, if it had these seven or eight or nine different instruments, and if the data rate is this, and if the resolution is that, and the bit depth is this, then what's the telemetry bandwidth that has to go here? And how long do you have to keep it? And how are you going to send it? How are you going to actually schedule these instruments? How are you going to position the satellite properly? How are you going to you know do a cost analysis on you know whether you do this observation versus that observation? How do you schedule these repeating observations over the course of a month? Blah, 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 blah. So we did all of that as systems engineers. You had to sort of look outside in. But it's curious to me that MITRE got involved with you around 1998 because I was doing this with TRW from 1988. 80, 88, okay. Yeah, what I was saying was, you know, I was doing this at TRW from 80, 1980 to 1982. So that's operation number one. Operation number two was you mentioned this outfit, this three-letter agency that had lots of uh, photographs, shall we say, okay? And uh, let's see, let me recall the actual years. This is 1986-ish to about 1989. I was at a subsidiary of TRW called the Electromagnetic Systems Lab, ESL. And we were building ways to analyze photographs. And initially, the source of these photographs were, and I think it's long enough now that I think I can say this, were U2 photographs. These are photographs taken from very high altitude with very good cameras. And what we were doing was very simple, mundane things like what percentage of this photograph was road? What percentage was peat moss? What percentage was green vegetation? What percentage was, you know, farming land? We could tell by basically various and simple spectral characteristics. Very, very Ex easy. Surface textures. Just count pixels. It's really easy, okay? But that's the way it started. Then it got more interesting. We got to say, okay, is this road connected to that road? If a vehicle is sitting here at time T, where could it be at time T plus delta T? And you have to take into account elevation, road type, uh, the forestry, the vegetation, whether or not it could be seen through the vegetation or whether it could be hidden by the vegetation. It turned out into a way of looking at how far could something that you wanted to track, how far could it go in four hours or two minutes or, you know, two, two days. And how could you then look for evidence that it was there? Okay. And if it had a specific, let's say, communication capability, and you knew what those limitations were, then eliminate those places where it could not communicate and nice. only look at the places where it could communicate. So we could look at those kind of things as well. So that was being done from... Like I said, about the mid '80s to about 1993, I was doing that work for ESL. And oh, by the way, that was ended up being very, very classified work because the sources of some of that imagery, okay, were not just YouTube <laughs> photographs. Okay, they were from systems that really didn't exist. So uh, we could have had some close calls, Barry. Uh, in some previous life's lives. Well, if I had wanted to go into defense contract work, yeah, I, I didn't want to do defense contract work. When I when I interviewed at Bell Laboratories in 68, 67, one of the four departments that they scheduled me to interview was a group that had this, the prime contract uh, for the anti-ballistic missile project. And in those days, nobody ever, nobody knew what an ABM was. It was, you know, all new idea. So I go into this department head's office, Mr. Katz, and he's going to explain to me that their department is doing something called the Anti-Ballistic Missile Project. And he begins the interview the way he does it with every interview. He grabs a piece of chalk. He's sitting behind his desk. I'm on a chair opposite his desk. And he lobs a piece of chalk at me, expecting me to catch it. <laughs> so I watched the chalk go by and land on the linoleum floor and break into pieces. And he says, you know, he says, a lot of people miss the chalk. He says, you didn't even try to catch it. 
And but he goes ahead and he explains ABM. And I say at, at the end of his spiel, I say, Mr. Katz, I don't want to work on weapon systems. I want to work on projects that I pray will be used for the general good and not for systems that I pray will never be used. And he says, Yeah, I, I understand. Sam. Yeah, I'm going to go a little bit uh, digressive at the moment. I read a lot of science fiction when I was young. And one of the principles that stuck with me in a book was any technology can be used for good or for bad. It's a matter of how you want to use your sword. So technologies by themselves are neither good nor bad. It's the application of it, right? Okay, so you could be in commercial business, working on, let's say, ways to walk in low gravity uh, conditions, and yet then find that you know what is it? These uh, these zipper uh, surfaces could be used for military purposes. You could also be in the military and then discover that hey, you discovered a brand new kind of orange juice, and it's applicable to commercial industry. So there's a lot of different ways you can look at how technology is developed. And it's not easy to tell that just being in commercial, you're working in a you know, life-affirming technology versus in the military or in the military industrial complex, you're working for death dealing. I mean, there's one way I could look at my work, which was, and by the way, that system I described earlier, was in my recollection and you know obviously biased uh, storytelling was instrumental in desert storm by allowing uh, our efforts to be very very focused very focused so you could say hey maybe it shortened whatever conflict there was maybe it saved quote unquote a certain category of lives, not the others, I admit, okay? But it may be saved a certain subcategory of lives. There's always different ways to tell the story. And the story is a story. It is just one way to present a narrative. So it's not as easy as saying, hey, I worked for TRW, therefore I was a death dealer, or I'm working right now for Egain, therefore I'm working on life-affirming you know, technology. It's, it's not that simple. Over. Yeah. And I said, I want to work on life affirming applications of technology on projects that I pray will be used for everybody's benefit and not for projects that I pray will never have to be used. I didn't want to develop technologies that I pray would never be used. That doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. I want to spend my resources working on things that are going to be positive, a positive benefit to the general public and that we're happy that are being used. So, in my opinion, That's Rather than looking at the technology, I would look at the people funding that technology. That is probably more indicative of where that technology is going to go. Yeah, it was the Defense Department was doing the ABM. Uh, ARP, well, it, was, it wasn't ARP, it was the Defense Department. And I could see developing the telecommunications network for the you know domestic phone network, that was a good thing. Uh, they got me out of bed in the morning. And 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 building a a weapon system that is going to shoot down an incoming missile that you hope you never have to fire it, you know, no thanks, but no thanks. I I, I doesn't get me out of bed in the morning, even if it paid more money, which it didn't. But, but a lot of people do it because they can because they can get a job doing it. They can get a, earn an income. That that wasn't an issue with me. I wanted to work on something that that I was proud of. Now, would you say that losing those jobs led to your research um, education, or was that just out of the blue? So, all right. So, after a brief time at MITRE, when there was no life affirming application of technology to work on, mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine uh, had just hired two people who worked, who had been working at Bolt Brannick and Newman, BBM. Oh, BBM, yeah. And he told me about this department they were working in. This department was developing educational software, mm -hmm. STEM-based software, so that they could use computers and the internet to improve STEM education in public schools. 
He says, this is educational technology research. I said, I had told Leiter, why don't we work on educational technology? And they said, well, we're not funded to that. So here, here was BBN um, had just um, lost two people who had gone to work for my friend of mine. And the reason is that the NSF, which is funding the work at BBN, was throttling back because their budget had been throttled back. Mm -hmm. And so he said, he, so my friend says, go over and talk to the same department that I just hired two people out of. Because they're, you know. So I went over there and I said to the guys, I said, look, I, I've been, I've been in my career now 21 years. And I've never taken a sabbatical, ever. And you're supposed to take a sabbatical every seven years. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm actually due for three years worth of sabbaticals. <laughs> said, but I have no credentials in educational technology. My credentials are in network planning. I said, let me take a sabbatical year and come in as an unfunded visiting scientist because I knew that they were running out of money. They didn't have okay. any money. So let me come in as an unfunded visiting scientist for a year on sabbatical to see if I can do something you know, worthwhile where I have no, no track record. And they said, how, how are they gonna turn that down, right? <laughs> So I started at BBN in the Educational Technology Research Group as an unfunded visiting scientist and stayed there for 10 years. Mostly unfunded, by the way, mostly unfunded. But, but because I was unfunded, I could do anything I wanted to as long as it didn't cost any money. Okay. And what didn't cost any money was figuring out how to use the new internet. We're talking about nine, 1990 now. Right. How to use the brand new internet to create educational resources out of out of nothing right okay? pioneer this so i was pioneering online learning communities and of course bbn had owned the internet i mean bbn had built the they were the prime contractor for the original ARPNET. so they already had, so bbn already is on the internet and they've got you know you've got your little desktop computer and everything so i'm basically working unfunded um developing educational technology resources that don't take any funding because I'm just using the existing new infrastructure. So I did that for 10 years. And one of the reasons that I was motivated to do that is that I had already thought about the role of emotions in learning. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to demonstrate that you could reduce those ideas to practice. So I needed a learning community where there were people doing learning. Okay. So we have this unfunded online learning community with adolescents who were both mostly children of people who were in high tech. That's how they got on the internet because their parents were in high tech universities or whatever. And I could now develop educational um, resources that were motivated by this role of emotions and learning. And because it was unfunded, I could do anything I wanted to. And that's what I And then I also went to the Science Museum as a weekend volunteer. So that was face to face with real people instead of on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I did the same thing there. I said, can I be an unfunded volunteer? Okay. Um, and also at the same time, see if I can reduce to practice this uh, uh, emotions and learning concept. And I stayed there for 25 years as a yeah. volunteer. And in both cases, after a decade at BBN and the internet went commercial in the late 90s and GTE bought up BBN to get BBN Planet to get the ownership of the infrastructure. And as soon as GTE, which then merged with Bell Atlantic to become Verizon, as soon as they bought up BBN, the NS NSF said, we're no longer funding you. When you, when you were a little company, we were happy to fund your little department. Now you're owned by this big, you know, telecom giant. We're not going to funding you anymore. So that was the end of <laughs> the end of the BBN thing. But in the meantime, I had a chance to go over to MIT Media Lab again as an unfunded visiting scientist. Mm -hmm. Because by that time, there was a chance to take this research on emotions and learning and see if we could get funding to do it in a, in an academic environment. So, 
So we we wrote a, a grant proposal. I say we three of us wrote a grant proposal. Right, and it got funded. Mm -hmm. So then I become so then I become a, uh, a consultant. Really, uh, not much of a role to to develop this. But at the same time. At the, so in the meantime, I'm still working in the Science Museum, except that 25 years after that, around, that, around 2015, the board of directors of the Science Museum says, um, we want to have defined messages for the Science Museum. And the messages have to be approved and, and all the volunteers and the staff have to be presenting material on message. Well, my little puzzle activity, which I'd invented this puzzle activity, and I brought my own puzzles, suddenly that wasn't one of the messages. Uh oh. <laughs> and they said, Barry, you're happy to say as a volunteer, but you can't do the puzzle activity anymore because it's not an official message. I said, you don't need me anymore. <laughs> the, the teenagers can do can do the, you know, the so, so yeah, there were little pockets of time right. when you had the so, freedom. So, so so they got rid of the, the bell system. <laughs> Mm -hmm. BBN, you know, had I had a ten year stint until that went commercial with the commercial. Yep. The Science Museum, same deal. They, you know, the the corporate, the board of directors had Google on it and Apple on it and, and Microsoft on it. Okay, they were really trying to direct the things towards stuff that would help sell technology products. So. Three or four times in my life, the fucking government or the powers that be basically made my role non-existent. Hmm. So in terms of free will, did you have free will? <laughs> Were you redirected <laughs> in a certain path? So I reinvented myself <laughs> yeah. you know, two uh -huh. or three times. I reinvented uh -huh. myself two or three times. And, and then finally... Finally, I'm, I mean, now 77, almost 78 years old. So really am retired now, but I was sort of semi-retired, but I actually worked unfunded, mostly unfunded since 1990. Not entirely funded, but. When you say unfunded, are you saying that you don't get any paycheck at all for the last 20, 35 years, 10 plus 25? Yeah, pretty much. I, I was, I, I basically was unsalaried since 1990, with exception of a few brief intervals where I was getting a very small amount of money. Uh, how do you how do you find your own living? I was laying off my life savings. Hmm. When I was at Bell Laboratories for 19 years, um, I was buying AT&T stock as part of the, you could you could put 3% of your salary into buying AT&T stock. And then you leave off that. Or maybe it was six. Maybe it was six, it was. I could put in six percent of my salary, right. and then the company would half match that with another three percent. Right. So it's like it's like a little bit of a raise. So I was buying AT and T stock for nineteen years, and that was basically my nest egg. And I was living off of that nest egg. Of course, after the break of the Bell system, that AT and T stock split into the Bell operating companies and a bunch of other stuff, and so now it's a mess. But I'm still living off of that nest egg, mm. plus Social Security, because my my highest salary I think was 1989 or 90, and so whatever that salary was when I turned 70 and a half, that becomes Social Security income, which is not a lot of money, but it's mm. not zero either. Nothing. But no pension for no pension from AT and T, zero pension. Um, Turned out that MITRE did have a, an employee, it wasn't a pension plan, it was some other kind of a plan. I remember exactly what, uh, I, IRA or some kind of a plan. IRA, yeah. That I, so I, I have an IRA from MITRE. I was only at like MITRE for like two and a half years, but I was putting as much money into the IRA as the system was supporting. It's not a pension, but it's like a, it's like a pension because it's my IRA. So I had the IRA from MITRE. I had no pension from AT and T, and I had my nest egg from buying AT and T stock for nineteen years. And I'm, and I bought my condo, uh, no mortgage, just bought it outright. And so I, I have no mortgage, 
and I'd have no dependence. So I could live frugally. I was able to live on, you know, without having to you know, unlike Hunter Biden, no, ma no Maseratis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was living frugally, you know, since 1990. And, and I could do what I wanted. Right. Provided that I wasn't working for the man. <laughs> but even the volunteer work, you know, basically they blew that up too. They changed the policy so that even the volunteer work got blown away. So I would say that you have some choices and in some places you don't have a choice. The question is, how is having no choice being useful as a, you know? Well, that's a good question. I mean, maybe, you know, um, after I'm dead and gone, they'll decide whether or not I made any memorable, worthwhile, lo long lasting contributions, or maybe it'll just, you know, be forgotten, go up and- No, that's, that part is not important. That's important part is for you, when how you feel when you having your last breath. I did it. No, no, I didn't quite do it. Well, I can't predict what that's going to be like. No, no but wasn't I mean, your research picked up by MIT and developed into effective computing? Well, yeah. So, uh, so Ross Picard right. uh, created this whole discipline of affective computing, created the affective computing group at, at the Media Lab and wrote the book, the textbook on it. I appear in her textbook as one half of one page. The emotions right, you, of learning is one half of one page of her textbook. But isn't your research part of that field? The, like of it, it, it fits in with it, but it's it's uh, oh, it's different. It's, it's almost invisible. It's an invisible tiny little piece. Okay. Because there's no money involved in it. It's a theory. Okay, but I've seen you have several papers out there. As yeah, well. I mean, yeah, it's... I mean, the very first peer-reviewed paper we wrote, which is two thousand and one. Mm -hmm after we got NSF funding. I went to Madison, Wisconsin to present the paper at a conference, um, the International Conference on Advanced Learning Technologies or something. Yeah, I remember the story, yep. <laughs> and we got the best theory paper award. Um, so the very first peer-reviewed publication got best theory paper award at the conference. Um, and when I wrote up the encyclopedia article on Google Knoll, it was ranked by the developers of Google Knowles, one of the top ranked uh, uh, articles on the site. And then of course they shut down Google Knoll <laughs> for whatever reason, I don't know. So it's out there. I mean, the literature is out there. It's not, it's not like it vanished into the wind, but good luck. If you do a Google search, see if you can find it. Yeah, I found a few of your papers and I understand your concepts. Um, I haven't I heard you the links. I gave you the links. Yeah, you gave me links. And I, <laughs> if I, I hadn't given the links, you, know, you would have, you probably would not have been able to find it. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, so I haven't heard back yet from Liza Loop uh, about her project. Uh, I sent her some feedback, but I haven't heard back yet. So there, there's maybe a few dozen people who know of this work, mm -hmm. who maybe referenced it in in their papers or something, um, but it's obscure. It's obscure little piece of work. Yeah, but it's your it's mark. Any, as I, as far as I saying, know, if, if, you, if you take a, a textbook in Psych 101 mm -hmm. at the university and you find the chapter on emotions and learning, if there is one, you won't find it in there. As far as I know, there's no textbook in Psych 101 uh, on okay. learning. It's exactly. not in the popular curriculum, but uh, your mark of your life is in those papers and whatever websites you've created. And... That's the one durable, I mean, the work I did at, in network planning, that's, you know, there is no telephone network anymore. And there's no landline network anymore. So that's sort of gone by the boards. Um, and this is the only work that I think still has a future. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I, I don't know of anybody who's picked it up and taken it to the next level. Are you saying that whatever you did on the network system doesn't apply to the fiber inter, intercontinental? Not really, because that was the analog network. Back in those days, we okay. were optimizing the analog network. Okay. Once the network went 100% digital, 
lost noise and echo management becomes yep. relevant. We were managing lost noise, echo, and other impairments on the voice network back when it was mostly analog. Okay. Loss and noise and echo were factors you had to deal with. And eventually yeah. that goes away with digital. And I noticed the analog cell phones I had better quality, in my opinion, than the digital when it first came out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we had optimized the analog network when that was the dominant technology. And, and I mean, the phone in this house is analog. But if you go into an office building, the, almost all the telephones are digital. They're yeah. digital right down to the telephone. Yeah. The home telephones are still analog within the house. But then you've, you go down to the terminal in the basement, and it probably goes to a fiber optic or something. probably goes digital as soon as it leaves the house. So it's only analog within the, within the space of your uh, living quarters. Anyway. Right. Yeah, like I have Verizon Fios, so there's a network yeah. converter box. That... Right. As soon as you got Fios, the the optical network terminal in your basement takes the analog signal and makes it digital for for fiber. So it's already digital. You know, it only goes for you know thirty yards before it goes before it's converted to digital. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's no lost noise and echo to deal with anymore. So that's all that's all long. that was that was the 1970s I'm talking about 50 years ago hmm. so if we go back and summarize the last half an hour conversation the conversation flow one way and whatever way they want to flow and having fun and smiling and you know sidetrack and all that stuff you Which, tell me i don't maybe i'm boring you to tears with this no question. basically the bohemian you know Theorem is basically it's like a guide reel. We don't touch it, we don't mess around with it, but it guides us sort of like we're on the right track. Nobody yelling at each other. We do have some silent. We're listening to each other. We're not making judgments, so on and so forth. So, but 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 consider, I mean, I don't know if my career is typical or atypical. I don't really know, but it, but it's not very inspiring. You think here's a guy graduates top of his class in electrical engineering at undergraduate, gets a job at Bell Laboratories. They send him to get a master's and a PhD at Stanford University. And then what happens to his career is the government blows everything up. You know, you 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 get in, you know, you get uh, 10 years um, of good work in at, at Bell Laboratories and then it, it just goes up in smoke. I would say it's pretty typical of most careers yeah. yeah. And uh, compared to Engelbart, he had his peak and then he's worked on that for years and then became obscure. Yeah. And, and, and it may it may be that my um, my story is it's not atypical for all I know. It could be that if you ask anybody, I'd say, oh, yeah, I had a I had a 10 or 15 or 20 years and then it kind of just, you know, fell apart, just went up into ether. And maybe that's generally the story is that, uh, you know, you become an, an unsung contributor for a slight window of opportunity before it becomes obsolescent. Now, yes. Is that U.S., the United States story, or is that worldwide? Worldwide. No question. It's yeah. probably worldwide. I mean, you right. go to Japan where you have, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, when the transistor was invented, Japan was the first country to actually develop transistorized consumer yep. products because the U.S. was still doing uh, vacuum tubes mm -hmm. and they didn't want to obsolete their vacuum tube system. So they basically didn't go with transistors until the Japanese basically came in with their crappy Japanese transistor radios in the 1950s. And then eventually the tube technology faded. And But most of the transistorized consumer stuff ended up coming out of Japan and eventually, you know, other Asian countries. And we don't, I don't know if we even make transistors well, because those were discrete transistors in those days. I don't know. So if if I were to mentor a young person about the future and all that stuff, as soon as this young person say that I want to work on only on life affirming application of technology, your path is, I would say, is pretty much given. It's that's decided that your path is nothing to optimize on or whatever i have have a different situation i you know i 
my brother and sister is coming over to study. I need them to have a job. Well, you know, they can work outside the company, you know, they can work outside company and I have a family need. So my situation construct what I need and I get to decide whatever I want to do. That's why I end up with wherever I am right here. So it's, it's the same thing, you know, when your meta outcome is decided, the rest, just go along with it. I mean, you sell your hardware to maybe capitalist companies, or maybe you sell it to government, or well, I don't yeah. know what you sell your stuff to. But. It's so different. It's, I don't care. Some people ask me, what do I, what do I, they call it the vertical market. What vertical market do you focus on, Sam? I only have one vertical market. You know what my vertical market is? It's customer with money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and that wasn't, I mean, I, I, I figured I, I can probably earn enough money to live comfortably. And for that, I want to make a difference. I want to leave the planet in better shape than I found it. And that meant not making it a more violent place. Yeah. Not not amping up the ability to use technology to blow up the world. I wanted to figure out, you know. So the telecommunications was one that sort of made sense. Yeah. And edu in educational technology made sense. Yeah. And and uh, science education made sense. And I knew that I would, nobody gets rich doing that stuff. Though I have... Friends who were who were public school teachers, or even professors, and they don't make a lot of money. I mean, think of this way: How many people can say, "I want to volunteer twenty five years to a museum. I want to volunteer for ten years for this company doing what I want to do." I mean, that's to me, that's a privilege, that's a luxury item that most people cannot afford. Yeah, but I, you know, basically, I didn't raise a family, didn't sire any children, so. I didn't, you know, I didn't buy any Maseratis or, you know, go on junkets to, uh, you know, to the South Pacific. Um, and that's not important to you. You see, that's important to you is, you know, you you get what you wanted. I, I did what I could do with what I had. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. You know, that's a you, good get, life. You, hmm? you decide your life based on your meta outcome. This is why I keep reminding everybody. And I ended up taking a lot of lumps that I didn't foresee. I didn't foresee break up the bell system. I didn't foresee that MITRE was going to end up not having life-affirming applications. I didn't foresee that BBN was going to get bought up by the telcos and, and the internet was going to go commercial and the social networks were going to turn into sewers. I didn't foresee any of that stuff coming. And it's so there's a lot of disappointments that, you know, seem to be a phenomenon that just is reality what's what are you putting your hands up for but that's life that's the point that in life is not utopia depends on how i you would think your life over anybody's life anytime barry trust me well i don't know, what I, trade, I don't know that, what I would trade it in for i really don't know what, what i'm saying would. to you is that you get to decide and you you'll be able to live in your alignment with your meta outcome and that's to me that's the number one thing i mean that's that's a privilege that's a I don't know what you call it, luxury item. That's what I call it. That's what I call it. Well, it, it's, you had choices to make. You made those choices. Not many people do. Yeah. Well, I I was required to make choices after the choice I had previously made basically got blown up in my face. the The path that I was on, the path got blown up in front of me. So I had to choose a different path. I so I had to reinvent myself. I don't know three or four times. And you did it successfully, you know? Well, I mean, That's yeah, what, what you mean by it. People define success differently than, you know, some people define success as becoming, you know, a billionaire. No, I didn't define that. I didn't define success as being rich or having a trophy wife or, you know, or being famous. I didn't define success as any of those more classical things. I define success as you are healthy at old age. Because well, you don't have all this emotional problem that cause you to have illnesses. Well, I'm reasonably healthy for you know for somebody who's said you're very healthy. Trust me, you're very healthy. Sedentary. I mean, you know, I was in the hospital for well four days. That's actually. nothing. Just ask your friend in the same age and see how many days they, they were in the hospital and how many times they were on the wheelchair. It's, it's true that when I went in and I said, I've never been in the hospital in my life at age 77, never been in the emergency room in my life. I think that they must have decided, you know, or determined that that's very uncommon. Yeah. Have a patient who's never been in the hospital in their life at age 77. Yep. 
Never been in the emergency room. Never been more than an occasional outpatient for some relatively minor uh, procedure. I lost is, is I lost is really three to five relative friends, dear friends, about three to five a year. So trust me, is. So you know, I'm not despondent, but uh, but but I'm not I'm not enthused about where our culture is going. I think our culture is not necessarily going in a fruitful, healthy direction. It's quite possible that our culture is going down the tubes. I, I, I mean, I can't predict it one way for sure. I think there's a probability. Um, I look at the, the political situation with people like Trump getting into power and Putin and, you know, and other assholes getting into power, the corrupt and wasting a lot of money on stupid stuff. And I look at that and I go, this is not cool. <laughs> Sammy, you got your hand up. I think the macro level will be exactly as you described. I think what's more interesting is to look at the micro level and see if we can create something else. Well, locally, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, lo locally, I can do something that uh, impacts maybe a dozen people. Like I, I, I volunteer at the fix it shop. Okay, so people bring in their broken lamps or broken irons or broken toasters, you know, and we fix them or we do the best we can to fix them and we don't charge any money except for parts that we have to buy and people are basically not throwing away an item because we managed to keep it working for another couple of years and so you know here i am at stanford phd doing fix-it jobs <laughs> at the community center you make a difference with the people that just got your item fixed well yeah because they they got their item fixed and they're, you know, they're happy to have their item. Uh, people bring in their little Christmas ornaments that aren't working, their little, you know. Appreciation. You know, the, you know the, the lights on their little Christmas thingy don't don't light up and we make them light up again. But did I, did I really need a Stanford PhD to do that? Probably not. <laughs> yes. I'm gonna throw out something else before I leave. All right. I'm gonna look for more musicians. Musicians. Well, you got one right there. You got one <laughs> out of clarinet. Is it a clarinet that you play? What do you play? Yeah. You well, like, clarinet. yeah, clarinet primary. Um, but I dabble in piano and guitar and other things. Did you also uh, play the uh, um, accordion? Brilliant? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm learning that. Um, I'm going to post a video in the chat uh, from Friday night. Uh, my synagogue had celebrating Hanukkah, and you'll see how the music. Uh, impacts the mood of the people there. People ask if I play an instrument. I say, well, I play the buffoon. <laughs> buffoon, yeah. Good instrument. <laughs> so maybe we can have a music as an introduction into our conversation. I play the clavicle. <laughs> play the clavicle and the buffoon. Sam, do you play an instrument? Nope, I'm not a musician. I. I learned how to play piano. I only have enough money to take one, I think three classes. I only I save it up enough money to play, learn piano for three classes. That's it. Anyway, before I leave, I'll say one more thing. Okay, that is on Friday. You'll recall probably about a month ago on November, uh, somewhere around the week of November 7th, I was in Hawaii, right? I was helping my parents move and finally get yeah. to Taiwan. So on November 7th, our, uh, the movers that I hired picked up the piano, and it finally arrived oh. this past Friday. Uh -huh. yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. Piano, it's actually a, an upright Steinway. So I'm actually uh, pretty happy with it. Uh, Has, get... Does it have to be tuned now that it's been moved? Most likely, yeah. yeah chances are it doesn't play very well. Yeah, it's spent like a month on a boat and then on trucks. So it's it probably cost not... you a pretty penny to tune it. Yeah. But anyway... It's a uh, it's a uh, 1998, I think, was when it was built. Oh, and it's uh, one of these nice Steinway uprights. So now I get oh. to play chamber music here. So Eric, cool. <laughs> that's why I say and it's only one of two reasons, by the way, why I say I'm looking for more musicians. Mm -hmm. The other reason is very pertinent to this conversation, by the way. So I'll explain that in a future session. Okay. Anyway, I'm all gonna... right. It's yeah, time have a great. Okay, Let's... talk to you guys later. Bye -bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Yeah, yeah.